want to talk about something millions of people can relate to, and that is the I have no friends trend. I'm 26 years old and I don't have any friends. I just feel so lonely. I'm just so lonely all the time. And, but I'm also terrified of it, and I also want to be alone. Like, do I re maybe I'm just meant to be alone? I thought to myself, hey, you know, like when you get to this age, you just don't have friends anymore. And it's kind of a hard realization to come to, but it just seemed normal. No one wants to go online to admit to the rest of the world that they have no friends. It's kind of embarrassing, and to be honest, it's something that I've carried a lot of shame over. It's something that I've tried to hide in my real life. That's just a sample of what some people on social media are confessing to that they have no friends. Hi, and welcome to the stream where we are all friends, and I'm Heidi Jo Castro. Today, the loneliness crisis. Technology has allowed people to connect in more ways than ever, but loneliness is on the rise. We'll look at why public health experts believe the problem has reached epidemic levels. With us to talk about loneliness in the U.S. state of Utah, Julianne holt Lundstad, professor of psychology and neuroscience and director of the Social Connection and Health Lab at Brigham Young University. In the state of Washington, Lucia Magis Weinberg, director of the University of Washington's International Adolescent Connection and Technology Laboratory. And in London, Harry Hobson, founder and director of the Neighborly Lab. And since we're talking about human connections today, here is your chance to connect with us. Please jump into our YouTube chat with your questions and your thoughts. Yes, thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion. I want to start with you, Harry. The loneliness we just saw displayed on those social media clips, is that hype? Is that just something more people are talking about? Or is this a real problem? Hi, Heidi. Um, it's a bit of both. It's 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 a very real thing. Uh, I'm based in London. Um, according to surveys here, about 8% of London population, that's about 700,000 people, uh, say that they're always or often lonely. So that's about 700,000 people just in this city. Wow. So it's a big real thing, severe loneliness. There's no doubt about that. Um, certainly, uh, the way it's been expressed by the young people we just saw on that clip um, shows that, as you say, people are speaking up much more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, people are being much more open and frank about it, which I'm sure is a good thing. Yeah, that's certainly the first step. You talked about the UK. Uh, in the US, there is specific evidence of loneliness as a pandemic. Julianne, you were the lead scientific editor of a recently published US Surgeon General Advisory, which I have here on my computer. It's titled, Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. And further down, it says that lacking social connection is as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And if and if uh, and it found that poor social connections is linked to real health outcomes like heart disease, stroke, the the risk of developing dementia. Julianne, just how serious are these warnings? Yeah, so, you know, when we take both the trends of significant portions of population that are lacking connection in, in one way or, or even multiple ways, along with these serious kinds of health consequences, um, the implications for public health are tremendous. Hmm. Um, you know, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, loneliness increases risk for earlier death by 26%, um, social isolation by 29%, living alone by 32%. Mm. Um, but the good news is that um, those who are more socially connected um, have an increased odds of survival by 50%. And so um, what we know is that um, humans are, are um, social beings um, were, were um, this is thought to be a fundamental human need uh, to connect. And so it's not surprising that when we lack this connection, that it has significant impacts on, on our body, our physiology, um, that ultimately can lead to some of these poorer health outcomes. Yeah. Lucia, the pandemic, of course, aggravated this. Can you tell me what that impact was? 
Certainly, and I focus especially on young people, adolescents between the ages of 10 now to 24, 25. And unfortunately, what many of us have felt during the pandemic is revealed in the data. We are seeing increases in loneliness, decreases in levels of social connectedness and social support in young people. Um, and we are also seeing social media as definitely the lifeline that allowed us to stay connected uh, in the face of the lack of in-person interactions, the closure of schools. Mm -hmm. So definitely a problem that we were seeing before the pandemic that has definitely been compounded and that should gather all of our attention. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up young people, um, but adults too are experiencing this. And we also have some numbers to support that. Um, on my computer, I have a report from Forbes Health that found 59% of U.S. adults find it harder to form relationships since COVID. And when asked, what are you most nervous about when socializing? Well, the, the, the most number of people, 29%, said not knowing what to say or how to interact. Ben, is it a simplification to say that this pandemic basically helped us or allowed us to forget how to socialize? I, um, hi, uh, Heidi. Yeah, I, I want to say a couple of quick things. Um, so just first of all, I just want to um, have a quick thought about kind of from our point of view, kind of what loneliness is like. Um, it's because I think I completely welcome this this amazing report um, from the Surgeon General. Um, but equally, I think it's important not to kind of pathologize loneliness. I think it is an ordinary, everyday part of life for all of us at different times in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a thing particularly for the young or for the old. I think it's any of us can become severely lonely. And it's particularly at times of change or transition or disjunction, when, mm. when life becomes really difficult really suddenly, and especially when you don't have the people around you who you're used to having to support you. So that can be people who are have big changes going on in their lives, people who are moving to a new place. Um, and it's particularly for people who are single or live alone, um, who, who are particularly kind of susceptible to severe loneliness. Mm, thank you so, so much. So I just think it's kind of important to realise it's not about... It, we used to think of it as a thing, especially for older people. More recently, there's lots of attention on younger people. Yeah. But actually, I think it's less about age and more about life circumstance. I don't know what, what the others think about that. And well, I'll just jump in. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, that social connection is a fundamental human need. And so it's mm. part of the human experience. And, you know, it's it's much like hunger and thirst. Um, and and mm. so it's this biological drive to help us motivate us to reconnect socially to meet this biological need. And so it's perfectly natural for and part of the human experience to feel loneliness from time to time. Um, but when people get stuck in it um, and it becomes persistent and severe over time um, is when we often um, feel or, or see some of these severe kinds of effects. But um, jumping back to, to the video and, and what you just mentioned, um, I, I also recently saw some data that showed that Google searches on, on how to make friends are at a 20 year high. Wow. <laughs> um, wow. And so, it, you know, it, I think it really shows that not only are people, um, you know, hungry, so to speak, to connect, mm -hmm. um, but are also feeling like maybe they don't have the adequate tools um, in order to do so. Yeah, Lucia, I wanted to uh, have you talk a little bit too about your research in Latin America, because we certainly don't want to make it seem like this loneliness problem is just the global north. But in fact, Gallup Research did a, a, an estimate that in 2021, it found more than 300 million people globally don't have a single friend. Lucia, have, have you seen that playing out in Latin America? Well, certainly. I think um, it is a global trend that we're seeing. I think there's differences in culture that might temper some of these effects. Uh, Latin America in general, it tends to be more collectivistic, family-oriented societies where I think there might be some protective factors that we're seeing play out. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one thing that I do want to bring up is that in studying adolescents, mm -hmm. uh, we in development talk about sensitive periods, right? So very early in life is a key sensitive period to learn to speak a language, for example. 
And we now know that adolescence is a key sensitive period for learning how to build relationships, how to foster them. So mm -hmm. I do worry about the fact of, of many children and adolescents who left school for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin America, for example, had in countries I work with all full two years of remote ed education where kids have not been able to practice these skills because these skills can be learned, can be taught and should be practiced. So it's not surprising to me that young people are asking online, how do I make friends, that they're unsure or uncertain of how to now socialize and interact. I think it's um, a concern that we're hearing from our undergraduate students as well coming back. So, so definitely very much thinking of how we can scaffold and support uh, these skills, these social emotional learning in young people and for everyone, right? It's a skill that we can all learn and practice. And it's interesting that these queries are being asked on Google uh, technology here. It has helped us and perhaps it has made us more lonely in some ways. That is a point of debate among researchers. Let's hear from Susan Matt, a history professor at Weber State University. Ironically, such technologies may actually make our loneliness worse. Psychologist Letitia Ann Peplau of UCLA in the 1980s suggested that loneliness was the feeling one experienced when you have an expectation of so many friends and a reality of a fewer number. So it's the gap between how many you want to have and how many you actually have. Social media encourages the belief that you can have an infinite number of friends. And it's that belief and that inability to ever rise up as high as we want in the number of friends that may heighten our experience of loneliness. Harry, I think there's yeah. a, a tendency in social media to make us think that we need constant Definitely. social affirmation. That might not be such a good thing. No, that's right. I think there's two reasons why social media um, kind of has this effect, If you, uh, what academics call social comparison. In other words, inviting us to compare ourselves often unfavorably mm. with people. Um, and the reason why that has such a harsh effect on us, and especially perhaps for, for teenagers, as Lucia has said, is, part, is for two reasons. First of all, the stuff that people post online is very filtered. Obviously, people, if you go onto Instagram or Facebook, what you seem to see is everybody having a brilliant time, everybody with their friends, everybody um, looking busy, looking um, smiley. Um, so that's bound to give people a sense of kind of negative self-perception by comparison. And then I think another reason is that the times when we perhaps go too far down that rabbit hole of social media are specifically times, moments in your day or in your life when you are on your own, mostly, and mm -hmm. perhaps a bit down or a bit low mood and feel particularly kind of susceptible or vulnerable to the effects of that kind of very acute social comparison. Yeah. So that's why um, social media can have this kind of really pernicious effect, I think. Yeah, and particularly yeah. on young people. Go, go ahead, Lucia. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that we actually measure and know what people are doing on social media, because I think we have uh, for a long time just focused on hours in front of a screen, which is not a great characterization of what we're doing online. So if I'm spending 30 minutes on a WhatsApp call with my very close friends, that is going to really build towards these meaningful connections, right? But if I'm just passively scrolling through Instagram, for example, without interacting with friends, just comparing myself to others, then that is going to have negative impacts on loneliness. And that's exactly what we're finding in our own research, right? When we're measuring positive online experiences, that actually associates with less loneliness mm -hmm. compared to when we measure negative online experiences, which relates to higher levels of loneliness. Yeah, it's certainly not that simple, right? Because so, there are so many different types. Go ahead, Julian. I was just going to add because, of course, um, you know, I, I fully agree that um, we need to pay attention to how time is used. But I also think we shouldn't um, entirely dismiss it because many of these tools are designed specifically to keep our attention. Um, and, and, um, and so we have to think about to what extent is this displacing other valued activities, including things mm -hmm. like interacting with others um, in person. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it becomes incredibly complex, of course, uh, but, but 
something we shouldn't um, neglect to consider. Absolutely. And on that note, perhaps taking this to a further extreme, the role of artificial intelligence. Uh, can artificial intelligence actually replace the void of no friends? I mean, it might seem like a silly question, but some people have uh, tried to turn to AI when they feel lonely. Um, for in one example, in Japan, the sale of robot pets boomed during the pandemic. Of course, this was during the lockdown and, and this helped people. Um, Harry, I mean, they, they're very cute. Uh, these yeah, robots seem harmless. Them. Yeah, me too, but, <laughs> but I, I, it probably shouldn't be my only friend, should it? Probably not, no. <laughs> um, I, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny seeing these robots and um, in some ways you can think of them as existing on a continuum through from dogs and companion animals that we've always had um, through to toys that we perhaps have in childhood as companions. Um, and these kind of things are almost more like toys, I'd say, than AIs mm -hmm. or, or some kind of mix of both. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think AI, I mean, well, first of all, let's just be completely clear. There's no substitute for human interaction. So social connection is about interaction between people. Yeah. And so anything which isn't is not that is 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 something lesser than good social contact, of course. Yeah. But having said that, so you can see roles for AI um, kind of helping people build their confidence, helping people give a sense of belonging, perhaps, um, and also perhaps most usefully, letting people get help in a really quick and customized. Mm -hmm way yeah um, in a way that ch chatbots already work well on websites and things like that there's so an example. there's lots of really positive roles yes there is one example i wanted to bring up it's uh, mm. from a california-based startup called replica and this company has an app mm. that lets you design your personal ai friend that's how it's marketed let's watch this promo video so the person you know you create your avatar um but then, of course, this is just a, a promo video, so this doesn't happen in the user's experience. But look there, <laughs> they're saying it's almost like having your real robot friend pop up next to you in your living room, doing yoga with you, et cetera. This video, of course, it's not what people will experience. But when I went to this company's website under popular questions, one was, is Replica sentient? I mean, the fact that people are asking perhaps means that they are confused. Julianne, what is the danger in this? Well, so our connections to others fulfill a variety of, of needs and, and roles and goals. And so, you know, we ought to be careful about thinking about what kinds of roles that, that AI might do quite well. Um, and where it either might fall short or even you know, cause harm. Hmm. Um, one of the things that we know can have a benefit um, um, in terms of, of our human connection, uh, that, that at least currently in the technology, um, we don't have a good substitute for is, is actual human touch. And hmm. um, not only is there um, a, a wide literature on the importance of human touch from um, you know, various neuropeptides to gut microbiome. Um, but even just anecdotally, we can think about even during the pandemic, how much we crave to just be, you know, be able to hug someone, yeah. to be able to hold someone's hand. Um, and, you know, as much as perhaps talking to others on, um, you know, on some video chat, it was just a poor substitute. <laughs> um, and, and so um, those are some areas where uh, we just aren't, it, it's not going to completely um, rip, replace um, human contact. No, but it's a little bit better than nothing. And we have um, a lot of people saying yeah. that in our YouTube chat, uh, David Bryden says, I moved to a new city after the lockdown and retired. I have found a group of friends, a community on YouTube live streams. It's been nice. And David, it's been nice to have you too. I'm glad you're joining this conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's that, uh, it's like what we were saying before, right? It's not just passively scrolling through things and ingesting content, but he and others are actually interacting in a, yeah. as a part of a community. I think that's right. I, I wanted to say, like, that guy David on your YouTube, he's getting some of what he needs from from his YouTube friends. Ideally, as as Julianne said, you know, real human contact we touch included is, is if you like, the kind of gold standard. It's what we all need and crave. But we can get a lot of what we need 
remotely through tech, um, through conversations that we have on the on the on on the phone or on WhatsApp or um, or by taking part in chat rooms and by getting to know our neighbours through tech um, groups and so on. So there's no doubt that tech plays a really, really helpful role in helping us connect. Um, but it's part of an ecosystem of healthy connection, and it can't be the only thing. Yeah, Lucia, and what... Actually, mm -hmm, go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah. To, to jump in, Harry, yeah. completely agree. Yeah. One of the interests in my lab right now is this idea of online-only friendships, mm. right? So it used mm -hmm. to be that when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I turned to the beginnings of social media to foster relationships that I already had. But now more and more we are documenting these online only friends, which might be young people uh, living in a different city, people we might never meet online. So in our, in our, in our studies, for example, 30, 40% of early adolescents already told me I have a person, I have a friend online that I have never and will never meet in person. Mm. And we're trying to characterize these types of friendships as first of all, very real for young yeah. people, mm -hmm. um, okay. where of course, uh, it's very early data, but of course, it's not the similar levels of closeness or trust, yeah. but very important sources of shared interests where young people can explore interest with people that they might not have locally. We think it might be particularly important for marginalized youth who might not find community uh, locally. So yeah. really paying attention, starting uh, to scratch the surface to understand how these online only friendships might yeah. look like. I want to also talk about some offline solutions. Uh, at a global health level, Japan and the UK both created ministries of loneliness in 2021. Harry, what does the what does UK's Minister of Loneliness do, and how is it helping? Oh, well, that's a tough one. Um, I think, in fact, our Minister of Loneliness was was a bit earlier, about um, 2016 or 17. Mm -hmm. um, no one's quite sure if we've still got one or not, okay. which um, <laughs> isn't very interesting. <laughs> but um, I think our stuff happens, changes so fast in our government, it's hard to yeah. keep up. But what about, um, but what public but policies said, but, but, do no, but, no, but, Yeah, I was going to say, seriously, I mean, city mayors, city planners, especially the mayor of London, um, are excellent at thinking hard about social infrastructure. In other words, putting the stuff in place that, um, and tweaking the environment in which we live our lives to help us connect. Uh, and that's what we at Neighbourly Lab do and work on particularly. Um, but certainly governments and city planners have a big role to play in making sure that we have the right kind of streets, the right kind of housing, the right kind of parks, the right kind of public spaces, amenities um, uh, to help us connect. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. I wanted to bring up one last uh, uh, example from the Netherlands, and there's a tweet about this on my laptop, uh, in which the Dutch government uh, created slow checkout lanes at a popular grocery chain. And this is for people who want to chat doesn't really care about getting out of there as efficiently as possible. They get at least a few minutes of face-to-face -face time with someone who would like to chat back with them. Um, and it's these small things, right, that do make a difference. And so in our final minutes of this show, um, I want to ask you guys for things that we and our viewers can do to personally help ourselves, help our families and our friends who are experiencing this loneliness. So if each of you can just in one sentence Tell our viewers directly what is one action they can take today to help themselves feel less lonely. Julianne, go ahead. I guess in one sentence, um, that's going to be tough, but um, I would say reach out um, to others. Um, we've found in research that just even small acts of kindness um, can can. Uh, not only um, impact your own loneliness, reduce that loneliness, but help you feel more connected to others and those in your community, yeah. um, reduce conflict and, and um, help others along the way. Thank you, Julianne. Lucia? Very much. I know a lot of people are anxious about reconnecting socially, but uh -huh. it does get easier the more you do it. So just start small. Just the hope. Maybe send that message that you wanted to send, yeah. call a friend, ask someone a question on the street. It gets easier with Thank practice. You. Thank so you. Definitely. And Harry, your last sentence of advice. Yeah, I love all that. And especially look out for people who are new in their place, uh, newcomers particularly. Look out for people who are single. Look out for people who've got lots of change going on in their life. Those are the people who are most likely to, to need your friendship. Thank you guys so much. That is all great advice. And for our viewers at home, thank you for watching today. If there's one thing you can do after this show, call a friend, call a family member, and thank you so much for watching the stream.